You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to The Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to The Archaeology Show, episode 199. On today's show, we talk about our favorite archaeology news of 2022. Let's dig a little deeper into those fantastic discoveries. Discoveries? Uh, important discoveries. <laughs> important news articles. Important rewritings of past discoveries. I don't know, whatever. Let's get to the episode. <laughs> Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> I did not know you were going to do that. Merry Christmas. And for Christmas, I get iPhone notifications. And <laughs> Nobody can hear that. Stop. All kinds of stuff. So, all right. If you happen to be listening to this in real time, then that means you either don't celebrate Christmas or you're just having like a light day. Which, by the way, we know that we are in a Christian country and that yeah. everybody is celebrating Christmas because that is where we live in the United States. But also, there's a lot of people out there that might not be celebrating Christmas right. today. So, hey, welcome to a regular old episode of The Archaeology <laughs> Show. But hey, we're not Christians either, but we also celebrate Christmas. Because for us, Christmas is like it's, a fun day with family and presents and yeah. food and eggnog, which I made last night. Yeah. My annual eggnog. The real stuff with real like stuff. all the liquor and stuff. It's good. Oh, this eggnog has got 12 eggs, <laughs> a cup of of bourbon, uh-huh. a half a cup of cognac, uh-huh. and a half a cup of dark rum, yep. and then like the cream and stuff like that. Yep, to get and it all creamy. It is just... It's so good. Yeah. I'm sure it's like slightly dangerous because like the eggs are never actually cooked, but they do sit in liquor for like, you know, 16 to 18 hours before we drink it. So yeah. that's fine, right? Yeah. Actually even longer. It's almost 24 hours. Yeah, it can be. We usually yeah. make it the day before, so yeah. it kills you all the to. bad egg stuff. Yep. And yeah. And... You know what? Nobody's ever gotten sick, and we've made it every year for, yeah. God, like 10 years now or something. Easily. So, yeah. yeah. Well, definitely. since grad school. Mm-hmm. That was the first year I made it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, which would have been so 2010? That, yeah. Nine? Well, Christmas of 2009. Oh, my God. That was a long time ago. Yeah. You really perfected so, this thing, so yeah. it's good. Anyway, so that's yeah. eggnog, the history of, at least mine. <laughs> Chris's personal history <laughs> of making eggnog. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to do just a, a fun little thing today, and it's partly because it's the end of the year, partly because it's Christmas, and yeah. you know, this is a weekly show, so we don't record too far ahead of time. Yeah. We're often the day or two before, but that's by design because we want current events. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's literally Christmas Eve as we're recording this. It is. I mean, we try to do like a few more days ahead than this, but man, it just gets Sometimes. so busy around the holidays, yeah. and we have just been slammed lately with right. family fun stuff i would say more than work almost yeah. at least in my case but that's all right it is what it is we're recording on christmas eve and you're gonna edit it and it's gonna be great <laughs> indeed so honestly we were thinking about not putting on episode at all because yeah. it is christmas day who's gonna listen to it but it's a part of the back catalog yeah and then i saw an article oh your favorite I, kind of article <laughs> yeah so i go through apple news probably several times a day yeah and there are always i always look at the headlines just see if anything news going on and then there's uh, it because of the things that i like and watch and the preferences i've said i see a lot of archaeology news as well and of course at the end of the year you see a lot of lists the yep. best of this the best that mm-hmm. first off you can have like sure the best Kanye West story of the year. That's great. You know, like what did is that, there a good one? What did that like douche nozzle do today? Right, that you want to know about. But right. to say that there's a best archaeology discovery is kind of a weird thing. It because is weird. All archaeology discoveries are good, and they they lend to the to the archaeological record and to the to yeah. historical knowledge of a people. And to quantify those is, I don't know, kind of a weird thing. Now. You could rename it and say the most important Mm -hmm. because important really, again, it's a subjective term. It really is. It's it's like what's important to one person or one culture or one country can be very different than what it is to somebody else. But I would define important by the amount of information or clarity it gives us into the historical Mm -hmm. record. Yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. So if it tells us something that fundamentally changes what we know about the historical events that took place somewhere, yeah. then I would call that important yeah. uh, personally. I, so I agree. Yeah. Well, anyway, there's a lot of those articles out there, but one that jumped out at me that I clicked on, it's it was said best. I think I don't, I, I'll tell you why I don't remember what the title was. Oh, it's in my notes, actually. Some of the best archaeological discoveries of 2022. And this is from ABC News, mm-hmm. uh, written by Teddy Grant, who I've tweeted to this morning. <laughs> and I'll talk about that later. So, did you really? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So, 
Teddy Grant, he's a, one of the digital news authors. One of the he's writers. written hundreds of articles yeah. for ABC News and other outlets. It's just one of the things he does. He doesn't, he's not a science writer, or if he is, he doesn't focus on science all the time because he had something about human rights in, I don't know, somewhere mm-hmm. else. I, I just looked at some of the other articles he's done to see if it's all science related, and mm-hmm. it's definitely not. So right. he's one of those ones that's tasked with just kind of like picking stuff up and running with it, yeah. saying, hey, could you write this? Mm-hmm. So he has literally no way personally to quantify the best archaeological discoveries of the year first off no. and he's probably doing it based off of i'm just guessing because they also don't mention in the article he doesn't say how he came up with these five or six things that are in the article like, no he doesn't even mention it i feel like he hedged his bets by saying some of like by titling it some of you can basically say well of course it's not everything and of right. course it's whatever i feel is the the best and blah 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 so like right. you get a lot of leeway with those words i think yeah and he's got the abc news engine behind him so maybe he pulled uh listener stat or, or reader stats yeah and maybe say the, the most read articles or something like that the yeah, stuff possibly. that got passed around or linked to the most you know yeah. who knows but anyway interesting story yes. so i found this article about three or four days ago yeah. uh, when we decided to talk about it again it's christmas eve right now he wrote it on december 22nd that's yeah. when it was first released and you found it around that day probably, probably on, that, on day. that day yeah, yeah. probably on that day because yeah. it's the 24th right now yeah because well, it was on that day it was yeah it was and by Yes, by this morning or yesterday. Was it yesterday? It was this morning. By I this think. morning, the name of the article had changed. Yes. And because one of the biggest reasons I wanted to talk about this is because one of the best archaeological discoveries he mentioned is the, the article title here is Scientists Discover Fossil of New Predatory Dinosaur Species <laughs> in Mongolia. How many times do we got to tell people that you, we don't dig we dinosaurs? We don't dig dinosaurs. Well, clearly somebody called him out on it because in the two days since this article was published, that, that title changed. And it's but changed in two places. In two pla- Yeah. But we know for sure that you saw it the way you saw it because one of our processes is when we find an article that we want to talk about, we use Trello to organize everything and you copy and paste the title right into Literally Trello copy and, paste and then it. you also copy and paste the link to go along yeah. with it. So we have all we it's like I mean I know you could have made a mistake in there somewhere, but probably not. Well, I mean, you're copying thing. and pasting, right? Yeah. Here's the thing. So in Apple News, you don't see the the real link from ABC. You see an Apple News link. Yeah. So that's the link I copied in because it's just between Rachel and I, and we yeah. don't try to post Apple News links because no. not everybody has Apple. No. And we are or, reading on our iPads primarily right. when we do this research. That's yeah. what we just so, tend to use. Yeah. So a lot of our stuff comes from Apple News links mm-hmm. originally, but then we try to go find the actual article yeah. from the news outlet because it's not Apple writing these. This is ABC News in this case. Yep. So the Apple News link is no help, but the new Apple title is some of the best discoveries of 2022. Yeah, they just dropped the word he dropped, archaeological. He dropped archaeological. Yeah. However, if you find try to look for that on ABC, you can type those exact words in. But what comes up is, from fossils discovered in Mongolia to 19th century shipwrecks, some of the biggest discoveries of the year. That's the new title. Do you know what it seems like? Because that title is way better than the original one. It's like they published it with the working title by accident and like meant to put a... a you know, more interesting, right. like zhuzh up that title a little bit and they almost like forgot to. Right. I don't, I'm not really giving them a pass, but if that's what happened and they meant to go back and like redo the title that, well, that was dumb, but yeah. at least it's better now. And at least they fixed it. Somebody well, must have called them on it. They kind of fixed it, but they also <laughs> know what SEO is. Search yeah. engine optimization. Yes. And because of that, they couldn't change the URL. Oh, what is the URL? The URL is <laughs> fossils-discovered-mongolia-19th-century-shipwrecks-biggest-archaeological. Yeah. 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 Okay, so maybe it was like totally wrong to begin with. It was totally wrong to begin with. Oh, man. Yeah. Non-scientific... So journal article writer people, right? Not journal. Anyways, I don't, I don't even want to talk about the stuff that's in here. Right. Yeah. We're, we're going to talk Although, about, I will say I read the whole article and most of the stuff in there are articles that we covered on the yeah. show it, with the exception of a couple Obviously not the paleontology one. We don't really cover, did we cover that the usually. Florida shipwreck on the beach? I don't I, think we did. We did. Well, we have a whole episode on shipwrecks, and I think that one might no, have been in there. No, this was recent. This was from Hurricane. Oh, it was. Ian, okay, then no, we yeah. definitely didn't talk about that one. Yeah, but we did talk about the Spanish shipwreck off the Oregon coast. That was the beeswax wreck. Yeah, we talked about the. There's some ancient tombs in Saqqara in in Egypt. We talked about those. Yep. Um, what else was there here? Oh, the surgical limb amputation. Now, we had a whole episode dedicated to surgery, and we also had a news story. And I think that this article got covered in amongst mm-hmm. all the surgery stuff that we talked yeah. about. So, yeah. So, basically, I think we covered all these. He, I mean, honestly, it's not a terrible list of 
the best discoveries. It's there's there's some cool stuff there. I just you know my whole point with this first segment is I want to talk about these lists. Yeah, like and and really you got to think about how are these being quantified? Because yeah, because these are definitely not the best discoveries. No, Who this knows is what like the we, best discoveries are. <laughs> is he like typed into Google like? Like archaeology 2022, yeah. and this is yeah. what came up, right? Right. So, yeah. These might be some of the most popular discoveries. Mm-hmm. Some yeah. of the most, you know, the, the ones that the public really latched on to, but does that yeah. make them the mm-hmm. best? No. And you can see why some of these are the most popular. Like, you've yeah. got the beeswax wreck thing. Like, that was big news just because it was interesting and right. different. And then the Egypt stuff with it being the 100 year anniversary of discovering King Tut's tomb, which we yeah. covered back in November when that was the, the anniversary yeah. or whatever. So, you get. I see why these things were pulled out of the search engine, whatever. That's that's how it happened. Yeah. And the final word I have a problem with is discovery, because a lot of times these articles come out. And for example, Paul and I on the Archaeotech show, we actually did a news episode that's going to be out shortly. It's not out as you're listening to this in real time, but it's going to be out shortly. And one of the things we talked about was a new metallurgical analysis of these tin ingots found Mm. on this ship. And it's apparently, I'd never heard of it, but Paul's a Middle Eastern archaeologist Mm -hmm. and apparently very famous shipwreck. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was carrying just like 11 metric tons of tin and and copper, which Mm -hmm. are used to make bronze. Mm -hmm. And just like all these other things, but this is the first metallurgical analysis that says likely where these oh, things where came, it from. came from. Yeah, right, and because yeah. and, it's their composition and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yep. But this shipwreck was discovered in 1983. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so it's not a discovery. No, it's new research and it's analysis. Re- yeah, but and could make a list like this. There is just so <laughs> much that happens in the scientific world where it's just people going back yeah. and looking at old things that have already been found because we didn't have the scientific knowledge or technology or whatever to do that kind of study on it back when it was first found. So the same with the Saqqara stuff in Egypt. I think everybody knew that there was a lot more stuff there. There just wasn't the money to excavate it or there wasn't the techniques needed to get down that far or whatever, you know, like there's a lot of reasons why that stuff hadn't been excavated before. So indeed. Yeah. So we're not going to go much over this one or any other best of lists. Yeah. However, we are going to come back on the other side of the break and talk about some of our favorite things that we covered this year. Yeah. These are a few of my favorite things. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Back in a minute. Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. All an archaeologist wants for Christmas is some fossil front teeth. <laughs> some fossil front teeth. <laughs> Welcome back to the that archaeology was show. Super bad. Episode 199, segment two. And we are going to talk about a few of our favorite things that we did this year. Yeah. And we'll have links to these in the show notes if you're new to the show and haven't heard them. If you are new to the show and haven't gone back to our back catalog, I mean, I'm not saying do that, but there is a lot of good stuff back there. There's yeah. easily several hundred hours of content for you to consume if you have a long, you know, road trip around the world or something in a balloon <laughs> or something like that. So anyway, these are some of our favorites, some of the stuff that really stuck out to us. And we're going to talk about it right now. So you actually picked out the first four. I only picked out one, I know, but I liked the ones that you picked out too. Yeah. So I just kind of added this one to the list. We have five here that we're going to talk about. Yeah. So I put these in order of release date, starting with the most recent and then going back from there. And the first two, I actually kind of relate those together because they happened around the same time as episode 189 and 191. And episode 191, it was a news episode. So we talked about the story, this big story that came out. It was the cover story of Scientific American called Viking Textiles Show Women Had Tremendous Power. So that episode we called or that that part of the episode was about just powerful Viking women and how Mm -hmm. they had a much bigger role in the Viking culture than maybe we realized before. Yeah, that was the whole point of the article, I thought, was they they're emphasized their role a little exactly. more. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it was kind of like what we were just talking about, where it's sort of a re-examination of artifacts and sites that had been excavated in the past and stuff like that to sort of reevaluate what their role would have looked like. 
around the same time, we also had the director of the Lady Sapiens movie on, which was something we had talked about earlier in the year, too, because it's a book that was published Mm -hmm. as well, which is just another look at how women have been misinterpreted in the archaeological record. Right. A lot of that is because of the views of men about women in the 1800s when archaeo- when archaeology was being established as a field because women had a like lesser domestic role in society at that time. That was sort of how how men and how the field of archaeology developed at that time too. Yeah. And it's been a hard thing to shake. And I'm not saying that everything about it is totally wrong too, but I think it is really interesting to just relook at what we have always said was the role of women Mm -hmm. in these various different ancient cultures and what the archaeology actually tells us about what these women were, who they were, what they were doing and that kind of thing. So I loved that pairing of episodes there. That was some of my favorite of the year. Yeah. I'm trying to think like, cause that's really good. And having those, I guess, realizations through research is is one of those really important things mm-hmm. so i would say again if you're going to make a list of things yeah you would list this among some of the most important things learned through archaeology mm-hmm. in 2022 and and like most important interesting things it's not one site it's not one find it's not one discovery it's it's looking at the archaeological record as a whole mm-hmm. and even with the vikings and just taking that that one culture and that one snapshot of the archaeology record you can draw these different conclusions and then lady sapiens of course is looking at the entirety of the world really so yeah. but none of it is one thing it's it's just looking at all of it and through a new lens through sure. you know a lens that's not colored by sexual discrimination you know <laughs> it's it's yeah. really great <laughs> yeah. yeah. and speaking of looking at things through different lenses we went to glacier national park over the summer mm-hmm. and this is the one i picked out as one of my favorite episodes mm-hmm. partly because it was different than anything i've ever done before and and partly because i just really like the subject matter and yeah. essentially what it was was we were We did this tour through Sun Tours, it's called, and Sun Tours is a Native American owned and run tour company Mm -hmm. that runs through Glacier National Park. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they do any other parks, but they definitely do Glacier. Yeah. And I mean, you can take their really cool like red bus tours from the old, uh, the old red buses they have from like the 30s, which are really neat. But and and honestly, I wanted to do one of those. But we would. We I know. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go back someday. Right. But those are, you know, those are, I would say, regular what you would call, you know, your standard tour guides, which mm-hmm. I'm, I'm willing to bet are fantastic. Probably know a lot. Mm-hmm. But Glacier National Park is a huge Native American history to it. Um, the tribes that have lived around there have lived around there for centuries and centuries and centuries, millennia. Mm-hmm. And to get the perspective of a Native American who still lives in the area and has grown up in the area and has, you know, friends and family in the area. And then of course has studied about Glacier National Park and learned about all these things to get his perspective was really great. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the guy who did our tour is Jack Gladstone. Yeah. And, He's like apparently a well-known singer songwriter in the area. Yeah. And uh, he's done lots of big things. His music is on Apple and Spotify. You can find it through the links on our on our show notes here mm-hmm. uh, for episode 187. And it was just really cool. And on the tour, I took around the, the recorder that we have and I recorded him doing things with his permission. Mm-hmm. And he would stop... On, so I guarantee the other tours weren't doing this. I don't even think they got out of the bus, the other tours. But no. he would stop and we'd all get out. And then he would sing us a song that he wrote about it's some so of cool. the cultural history of Glacier National Park. Uh, yeah, I guarantee you <laughs> that nobody on the red buses were getting that kind of performance. Yeah, <laughs> it was amazing. Not. But I think, and we talked about this on the show too, it's the Native Americans that, that lived in this land. They, they were there before any of the white settlers came in. Yeah. And they're still there. And... I think that having his like cultural perspective added to it just added so much to the tour. And Mm -hmm. we really enjoyed that. And, you know, there wasn't a whole lot about the we didn't learn a whole lot about the archaeology of the area. Not really while we were there. But as archaeology per se. Yeah. But like as we learn more because, you know, things always come up. It just having the the cultural like anchor Mm -hmm. from having done this, I think, was really cool. And it makes me want to find more places doing things like that that are really bringing forward the native american cultures that were in the area in the united states before the the rest of 
you know, the settlers came in. So it's just really cool to add their perspective. Right. You know, from modern, from the modern natives that are living there now. I Indeed. love that. Yeah, that was really fun. Mm-hmm. So very different episode, very difficult episode to put together. Yeah. But it was, it was really cool. You did such a good job of like stringing together Jack singing and telling yeah. like little bits of the story. And then we brought in some of the history that we did when we did the mm-hmm. research. But like it was... You know, when we just when we're just editing these podcasts, it's just like taking out the the dumb things we say <laughs> where we mess up the ums, the uhs, the whatevers. Right. right. But with that one, you had to have like you had to edit from a, a content standpoint yeah. and make things flow together. And it was much more creative, I think, yeah, than for sure. what these normally are. So that was kind of fun for That's you. Why I it think. took like eight times as long. <laughs> it as did, well. But yeah. you really enjoyed doing it, too. Yeah. It was You kept like stopping and like playing little bits of it for me as you went along. So if you want more of that kind of content, then consider arcpodnet.com forward slash members. (laughs) So you can uh, can... help me make this a career. (laughs) Yeah, I'll quit everything else I'm doing and make episodes like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because we would love to do more stuff like that. And we will. We will seek out those kind of tours and things as we as we go around the country, of course. Exactly. but you, you don't always get the right permission. So yeah. that one, just everything sort of worked out that we were able to do that. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, we're going to take another break and come back on the other side and talk about something that impacted pretty much the entire world this year yeah. and exposed a lot of archaeology as a result. Back in a minute. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At Grand Canyon University, we believe in equal opportunity, and the American dream starts with purpose. To serve others in ways that promote human flourishing and create a ripple effect of transformation for generations to come, find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, Dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Oh, <clears throat> oh my throat is really dry. Must be the drought we're having this year. <laughs> So, like, wait, you're having a personal drought? I'm and having a also, personal drought. And also, like, the world is going through, like, a true drought. Is that... Anytime is that I'm what thirsty you're... now, it's going to be called a personal <laughs> drought. personal drought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, you're so dumb. Welcome back to episode 199 of the Archaeology Show, the last episode of the year. And we're talking about some of our favorite podcasts that we did over the year and some of the topics that we talked mm-hmm. about. Yeah, and this one, it was one I picked out, but I think I kind of picked it out because I know how much you really yeah. enjoyed this topic and these articles that we found too. It was episode 185 and it's called If You Can See Me Weep. And we called it that because of the the stones that people carve into that are being uncovered by this terrible drought we're having in the receding waters. And in the past, people would carve names and dates and terrible messages like If You Can See Me Weep. Into various stones that were only visible when when drought water got super low. Yeah, and when it's actually, drought made the water super low. And it's actually if you can see me, comma weep. Yeah, <laughs> because if you can see the stone, the water's too low, and you probably have no food. Yeah, so, yeah, you're probably already weeping. Right, so yeah, right. yeah, so, totally. Yeah, it's just a you know pe- people who have gone through these things before have memorialized the event with with some of these drought stones they were called, and then you know. Anytime you see them again, you know that you're about to hit the same situation. Yeah, like if you're not starving yet, you're probably going to be soon. So enjoy. So maybe prepare. So maybe the people that went through the drought should place it a little higher. (laughs) So just like if you can see me, you're going to be weeping. Yeah, like get ready because this is coming and it's going to suck a lot. (laughs) Right. That would be a way better stone to like put it like right above it. (laughs) Totally. And then maybe like a pack of nuts or seeds or something next to it, like a little geocache. Because that'll handle you know the famine that happens because of drought and the water it's in. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, drought archaeology is a real big thing this year because all over the American West and in lots of places like in the Middle East and and all over the world, really, there has been a lack of rainfall. Yeah. And water supplies and resources are dwindling. And Mm -hmm. 
what it's doing is revealing a lot of stuff. Lake Mead is a famous example <laughs> of just like all the crap people have basically thrown into yeah. Los Angeles's water supply yeah. over the past like 60 years. Including like multiple bodies? Multiple bodies. Now, in some cases, it's like drowning victims who mm-hmm. people knew drowned, finally recovering the remains, which is great for the families. But in one case, it was definitely like a murder victim that they found yeah. in a barrel. So Not, not too many people drown in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> not, Accidentally. not that that's archaeology, although I guess it's kind of like forensic archaeology at that point when you recover just bones like really. that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, in other places in the world, they found some really cool sites, mm-hmm. sites that they have known about, but they don't always get to study because they're underwater. And underwater archaeology is just a much bigger endeavor. So they yeah. don't really have the resources or the the money to, you know, do that kind of. But when a drought happens and the water recedes, hey, you're going to have that moment to get your study done. So, yeah. Well, and a lot of times, and I know that happened in this country because my thesis site was a reservoir in oh, Georgia. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And they knew they were making it a reservoir. They were they were damming up. It's Lake Oconee. And I don't know if it was the Oconee River that also made that or not. But uh, anyway, yeah, I don't they know. were filling it up. It was the mid-70s and mm-hmm. they knew that they were doing it. So they contracted the University of Georgia to actually do an intensive archaeological research around the whole flood area. Mm-hmm. And I mean, probably, you know, many of the PhDs doled out in the early 80s at Georgia were from people doing research on these on sites. sites. Cuz there's yeah. there's a lot of significant sites there it sounds like that yeah. they just they ran through it did all the excavation collected all the artifacts and then basically just put them away and yeah. budding archaeologists have been able to use it for their PhD and yeah. master's degree research since then. Yeah, I was on an accelerated program so I didn't have time to dig up my own site. Right. Unless I had already done that and was bringing a collection. Yeah. So I went through one of the collections that was from that area that was never really fully analyzed. Mm-hmm. So Which I think anyway. is great because these collections sit in yeah. in, you know, a basement somewhere and nobody does anything <laughs> right. with it. It's almost better to do that rather than dig up more things when there's so much out there that needs to be analyzed still. Yeah, there were over 60 bankers boxes that I went through. Yeah, I remember that. It was was kind of miserable for you. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. Anyway, point is, the reservoirs in this country, when all this was being done and dams were being built, it was part of a jobs act, of Mm -hmm. course, in the 30s and 40s where some of this was being done. And then later on, when some of the reservoirs were being created, it was just a time when that was happening. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them happened all at the same time. But also at the same time, we had budding laws about, hey, you should probably check out the cultural resources Mm -hmm. while you're doing this. But they weren't really fully being enforced and things like that. So there are a number of reservoirs, even in this country, where, yeah, we may have known something was there. We flooded some towns in some cases. Mm -hmm. We we flooded some known archaeological resources. And now they're coming back to light. It's not like we didn't know it was there, but Mm -hmm. it's like, hey, it's kind of cool to see that again. It sucks we're in a drought, but it's kind of cool to see that again. It's like the silver lining of the drought, I guess, is that you get to see some of these things that have been covered. Well, I know I know we covered one thing over I can't remember where it was on the other side of the planet somewhere where they actually did do some archaeological research on something and then it was uncovered by drought and they were able to go back and do some more research before it filled up again. Yeah, that was probably the Spanish Stonehenge. I'm looking at our our episode here now. The Spanish Stonehenge is they've known it was there. And what is really interesting is that it becomes part of the economy of the small towns around this lake but I think it's a lake mm-hmm. that the Spanish Stonehenge is on. Yeah, because, it's a dam-controlled lake. Yeah, exactly. And so when it emerges because of drought, all these small you know, entrepreneurs can start taking tourists to see the site as a little part of their economy because, because of yeah. drought, I guess. So now you can walk around these sites without getting your pants wet. Um, <laughs> and how, how long ago <laughs> could you have done that? What are some of the oldest pants? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> A, so, that was a. If you didn't notice it, that was like a masterful segue. I'm not sure that that would be the word that I would use, but it was a segue. <laughs> so, so now, as you can imagine, the next episode that I picked is episode 161. It was a news article episode, and one of the articles we covered was about the oldest pants. And anybody who's been listening for a while knows that I'm super obsessed with textile. I'm a knitter. I love anything cloth related. So when I saw this article that came out last spring about the oldest world's oldest trousers use methods still employed by modern fashion. You know, I was like a hundred thousand percent in. I love this article. I thought it was so fun. They went really, really in depth on the different techniques that were used to create it. Most of it was weaving, different weaving techniques, like to make twills, like the kind of twill that you see for khaki pants, that kind of thing, or 
even like a brocade kind of a thing, like that kind of weaving technique is mm-hmm. what was used to make all the patterns and the really heavy, thick fabric. But that combined with the fact that these were pants instead of some sort of like drapey cloth thing, right. which is what we have mostly found. Like in, legit pants. Yeah, these are legit pants and they're super old. They're uh, 3,000 to 3,300 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that is very old for pants, apparently. Yeah. (laughs) Not a lot of pants before that time. Anyway, that that we have. So, yeah, the whole thing was just so cool to me. I really, like, got into that. I'm sure in the episode I went, like, deep into the how to make these different twills and stuff like that. Because I have a loom and I have experimented a little bit with making this kind of stuff. So I just, I really loved that article and I thought it was super fun to talk about the world's oldest pants. So kind of a fun side story that came Mm -hmm. out just a few weeks ago when we haven't talked about this. Oh yeah. Is the USS Central America in 1857 was sailing from Panama to New York and sank in a hurricane with 425 people aboard. Yeah. Yeah, it was a passenger ship. Uh Uh-huh. And... The wreck was actually discovered uh, off the coast of South Carolina in 1988, and a lot of research and things have been done on it since then. But one of the things that was found in a trunk was a pair of pants. That's right. And it's a pair of pants, a button fly pants that actually, if you look at the picture, they look like acid wash jeans at this point because they've been sitting in salt water <laughs> for the last 160 years. Right. But they're, they, I mean, they look like a pair of pants you probably buy off the shelf yeah. yesterday. They're right? like Levi's or something, right? Well, it turns out that with the button fly, I think they determined that they probably are Levi's given yeah. who was making those at that time. Right. And Levi's was essentially making those for the miners in California. Yeah. For, yeah. That's kind of where they were developed. Yeah. But miners specifically okay. in California. Oh. Oh, okay. And this ship was coming from Panama. It's thought that the person who had them was actually took a ship from California down to Panama and oh. then got on another ship in Panama. Or perhaps this ship came from California. There was no canal. Yeah. So you had to go down to Panama, which is the narrowest point. Cross and then you the could land. Cross the isthmus there. Yeah. And then, and then go across because okay. the canal wasn't built until uh, the 1890s, yeah, 1880s yeah. or something like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So anyway... That's what that's what this is for. And those pants sold at auction in December this month of mm-hmm. 2022 for $114,000. <laughs> you can't so, even wear them. That's so insane. Yeah. Wow, that is so crazy. And I actually have like so many questions about that because <laughs> what it it was a ship that sank and then they excavated it or they scavenged it in the 80s. And that's how they ended up coming up for sale, and it well, was totally okay to buy them. It wasn't an archaeological. It wasn't uh, thing. an archaeological. No, thing. it was treasure hunters. Shipwrecks are different. Yeah, I shipwrecks think they have are different, different laws and things. Ships, shipwrecks are very different. Depends yeah. on how far off the coast they are, who kind of owns them. Yeah, but if it's in international yeah. waters, and, and you find and you it, find it, it's there's all like yours. salvage laws or whatever, yeah, right? You, you get the rights to it. Yeah. So, especially if it's 160 years old, which is it's kind of sad because it's like if there were archaeologists involved, we might have gotten a little bit more information yeah. about who those pants belong to and what they were doing and where they were going but these companies they're they're interested in making money off off provenance yeah so they do a pretty good job of recovery in most cases yeah yeah Yeah, so they you know they they know some things about these so really Um, really cool and also old pants so that's tangentially related pretty neat three thousand years old 160 years old yeah kind of the same (laughs) kind of the same yes (laughs) not at all that's fine So the last thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to call this an honorable mention and because we did talk about this sort of this year, but it actually was an article from last year, but I'm giving it an honorable mention because I'm really rooting for it as like a a find, an archaeological find that I want to see more of (laughs) and I want it to get be studied better and I want it to just rock the world of North American archaeologists. So this is like, it's almost like my prediction. I think I'm making a prediction for 2023. Okay. Here's my prediction. Footprints. I think footprints are going to become like the shining star of changing what we know about how, about the peopling of North America. Yeah. Now this started with the white sands footprints last year that using pollen remains that were squished between layers. And so they know exactly when those pollen remains came from. That's a very, very simplistic version of what they were doing. Go Mm -hmm. listen to the episode if you want to hear more, but they can say that these footprints are something like 20,000 years old. Right. And then they did that again this year. And we talked about it earlier this year. There's some footprints in Utah where basically the same thing happened. This guy has gotten really good at seeing footprints because they're super, super hard to see on the playa. You have to know exactly what you're looking for. They're kind of like phantoms Mm -hmm. almost. But if you can find them and if they have the right 
stuff squished in them, then you can date them. And if they can find more sites like that, they can really start pushing back the date. Well, maybe not pushing back, but refining the date of when people entered into North America in different places in different times. So, I mean, it is pushing it back, though, because weren't those White Sands ones in like the 25,000 range? They were like like 20 to 25. Like, so they that one definitely pushed it back. I don't think Utah pushes it back. I think Utah is right in line with what they kind of knew and expected. I don't remember. But the fact that they found them is the really cool thing. It's it's like they're looking for this thing that they weren't ever really looking for before. And if they can really have some solid science and and backing around the dating of these footprints via the relative dating methods that they're using. Mm -hmm. The cool thing about them is their footprints. Nobody can say that, hey, these were actually made by crocodiles. No, they weren't. (laughs) Those are human footprints. We didn't have we didn't have gorillas in this country, which may have a similar footprint, although it's a much bigger foot. Wasn't it like giant sloths or something was what somebody or baby sloths was what somebody was saying might have be mixing up with human footprints. So there's still some stuff to work out there for sure yeah but, but like a human footprint's a human footprint yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, so that's really cool unlike sites like the saruti mastodon site which has I come up a few you more you times weren't allowed to talk about Listen, that i'm just saying <laughs> that is that is one of the oldest supposed archaeological sites that we may have in this country at about one hundred and twenty five thousand mm-hmm. years or 130 something like that either way it's in san diego and it's so far beyond what anybody thinks is possible in this country that we just need a lot more evidence to support that kind of a theory, yeah. right? But that site is very contentious because the things that they say are human created artifacts could have been created by natural processes mm-hmm. as well. It's just they're in association with fossilized mastodon bones and yeah, the, a, a connection has been made there where maybe a connection doesn't exist. So yeah. we just need more evidence, more sites, more ways to refine our thinking about these things. And, you know, that's what happens. That's how we ended up with pre-Clovis. Yeah. People thought that Clovis was the oldest thing in this continent until we had pre-Clovis. Until we had pre-Clovis. <laughs> we, and... we were so stupid and didn't know what to call it. It's just before Clovis. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, like as we get more data, we're going to have to start defining that a little bit better it can't yeah, just well, be pre-clovis have. but yeah we have in some areas in some but, areas yeah, we yeah. still call it pre-clovis though in a lot of cases it is it's so. like that whole general time period yeah. is pre-clovis but. well and part of the reason for that is clovis is is continent wide yeah but a lot of the pre-clovis stuff is regional mm-hmm. so you know there's definitely pre-clovis in in nevada california yeah yep. those areas with like the western stem tradition yep. and stuff like that yeah totally and i'm willing to bet there's pre-clovis in other areas but it's not like like the clovis point was found all throughout north america mm-hmm. and i think even in south america i think so yeah yeah so yeah. but the assumption was made that that's the same group of people mm-hmm. or, or the same technological spread mm-hmm. not the same people traveling around these places but the idea traveling around in mm-hmm. a short period of time. I don't know if I believe that or not, but either yeah. way. I think it was just a a logical way to make a projectile point that was good to fit to a spear. And yeah. the idea, you know, either was independently invented yeah. or caught on. Yeah, and they were also hunting like big game stuff around yeah. that time. So they needed a nice sturdy big spear right. to, to make that work. So it yeah. makes sense that it would have been developed independently. For sure. Or it could be shared knowledge. I bet both. Yeah. Okay. So that was my, I, I'm really springing this on you right now. And I know that, but this footprints thing for me has turned into a 2023 prediction that they're going to refine the footprint technology and that they're going to find more of them. Okay. Do you have any predictions or, or hopes and dreams for archaeology in 2023? Hmm. My hope is that we, we get closer and closer to figuring out when the first peopling of the Americas was. I just want more, more stuff info. that is mid to pre ice age. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to know, you know, we're, we're people really here. And the cool thing about White Sands is White Sands was not under ice. Yeah. You know, so White Sands, that area has been ice free for many, many hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, until the continents moved around and maybe it was under ice at some point, but that's Mm -hmm. well before any sort of concept. But I just, I just want to find more evidence of that because we still don't know conclusively when people got to the Americas. Mm -hmm. We have ideas and and I'd be willing to bet like all things and I've said this before, and I think other researchers have definitely said it too. It, it almost couldn't have been one event. No, I yeah. mean, how? What are the chances that the first people to make it to this continent populate the entire continent? Mm-hmm. That would be genetically isolating. You'd be yeah. able to figure that out. Yeah. But the fact is, you can't. Yeah. Right. So. It had to have been multiple events. It had to have been multiple times people actually found, 
you know, different parts of, of North America mm-hmm. and South America for that matter. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I just, I really wish we could keep pushing those dates back, mm-hmm. you know, because the further we push them back, the closer we get to the truth of the story. So your prediction is a broader version of my prediction then? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you want specifically footprints. I do. I I'll do. take anything. You, okay, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and hopefully archaeologists can learn from some of these older yeah. sites. And also, you know, especially cultural resource management archaeologists, we were talking about this in one of the breaks. We're not digging deep enough. Yeah. If, oh, if yeah, there's definitely. definitely. If there's a, I don't know how many times we've been archaeological sites where they've said, okay, so we've done a, a sampling of this area or we've looked at soil profiles or soil data mm-hmm. maps and we've said, you know, we don't have to dig deeper than, you know, a meter, two meters, whatever mm-hmm. the case may be, because that's too far. That's too far back. Yeah. The cultural layer ends here, basically, yeah. and you don't have to go below that. Mm. Plus, another common thing that we do, regardless of what the layers look like, is we will often dig. And again, it, a lot of this is based on finances and money and, you know, the project doesn't have it. But we will dig if we're digging in 10 centimeter levels, which is common. We will often stop if we've got two sterile levels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes there's a minimum you have to go to. Mm-hmm. Even if you have two sterile levels, it's like we well, got to go to at least a meter. Yeah. But if you but sometimes there's not. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if you got two sterile levels and they're the first two levels, mm-hmm. uh, we've been definitely been on projects where you just move on. You just move on. But how do you know there's not something deeper than that? Yeah. Yeah. You that know? makes me think about Wilmington specifically because it was on Wilmington, the coast. North Carolina. Yeah. Wilmington, North Carolina. It was on the coast and we basically knew about the the prehistory of the area from right. testing. So we knew that we were going to find a lot of pottery and that when we hit a sterile chunk of sand that we were good. And then I think there was a soil color difference too. Like yeah. when we knew we knew when we hit like yellow or white or something that we were done. We were good for that it, time period. It, it sh- yeah, exactly. But that does make me wonder because... What if there was older stuff below that and we just... There almost certainly was. There must... Yeah. Like, there very well could have been People in that area. People have been area. on that coast for a minimum of 10,000 yeah. years. We know that. And it makes me wonder why they decided that we weren't going to find anything below that and we could stop. Like, who made because that decision and why? it would cost too much money. It would I cost know, too much money. But it, and it could have been so important. A lot of CRM decisions are based on the fact that the disturbance is not going to go that deep. Yeah. Although in this case, they dug the whole thing out and made a marina they did. on the site that we were yeah, at. Yeah, so. like they were filling it in with water. Yeah, they probably went down so. two or three meters right there. Yeah, they probably yeah, did. Yeah, we certainly did not in our excavations. No, it does make me wonder if there was some some shady stuff going on there. But I don't know I, if it's never shady. Wanna... It's always business decisions and people kind of look the other way because we we count ourselves lucky that we can dig anything there at all. And that's how archaeologists think sometimes. Yeah. You know, if you come back and say it's going to cost $10 million to excavate this, yeah. well, they'll find another way or they'll find another company. Yeah. And to be fair, we did some really, really great excavations. We found some really amazing stuff, including a, you found a cache of points oh, yeah, that had cool. been dropped together, like all like face down in the ground together. Like they were in a pouch. Yeah. It was so cool. So don't get me wrong. We did some really good work there, but it yeah. does make me wonder if we... It makes me wonder two things. One, why why did we stop digging? Like, what mm-hmm. what did the people above us? Why did they decide that? And all, and two, what did we miss? Yeah. But this was fifteen years ago before pre Clovis had really like right. been accepted by the greater community. So maybe we stopped because geologically speaking, right. there shouldn't have been anything there at that time. I don't know. Okay, well, we're going to stop this podcast because temporally speaking, we're done. <laughs> and I need to edit it. Yep, you got to edit. Yeah. I got to cook. So That's right. it's time. All right. Well, we hope if you celebrate Christmas that you have a Merry Christmas. If you celebrate any other holiday that you have a happy holidays. And either way, we're all celebrating or at least enduring the end of the year, <laughs> whether it's a <laughs> celebration or not for you. I don't know. Uh-huh. But either way, let's hope uh, we get some more great archaeological discoveries yeah. or at least revelations. That's the hope. In 2020. Fingers crossed for footprints. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fingers crossed for more drought. No, oh, not more drought. no, no, not that. There is a silver lining to droughts, though. Yeah. It's, it's not good. Salt. It's, it's not good enough, crust. though. It's not actually silver. <laughs> yeah. Oh, All right. That was bad. See you guys in the new year. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.archpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day.
This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it, Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. .com.